I consider myself a shy extrovert with introvert tendencies. And the thing that I discovered is that because there's a shyness, the best way to deal with shyness is to get the focus off you as fast as possible. And what better way of doing that than asking someone else a question? Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In the show, my guests and I explore how we can use creativity to do our best work and live our best lives. I talk with authors, musicians, actors, scientists, and others who are all pushing the envelope to live fully, creatively, and authentically. Listen in to get the scoop on how you can do it too. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super thrilled you're here. I'm also so excited about my guest this week. John Dudekis is a former CNN senior copy editor on the award-winning The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, so you know he's got cred. And he's also a former White House correspondent, which plays really well into what we're going to be talking about today. And he left reporting the news to write about. And it's amazing to me that his Lark Chadwick series is as gripping and insightful and full of suspense as it is because I'm jaded. I love mysteries. I love spy stories. And he got me. I mean, I've read all the greats and he got me. And it's terrific, terrific book. So Fake, the latest in the series, in this book, John tackles fake news and how it can ruin lives and perhaps even topple governments. John and I met at a meeting of the Maryland Writers Association. John was teaching a workshop and I had the pleasure of learning from him. If you ever get a chance to check out one of his workshops, do it, do not pass go, do not collect $200. It's incredible. <laughs> and really, because some of what he taught me that day changed my writing style and really in some ways my life. So I'm thrilled to welcome John Dudekis. Welcome. Wow, thank you very much. This is so great. So I, I think it's so funny that we met at a writing workshop because I actually had never heard of you before then. And you <laughs> came this in. This is true of most people. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you see, you came in and you had this wonderful exercise. It was a writing exercise. And I did it and I went, wait a minute. I know because you gave us prompts and I didn't realize that what I needed in order to really prompt my writing was prompt. So, so I'm, hmm. you, 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 can, you cannot know how grateful I am for that little hook that you gave me that has changed how I write and how I've written most of the books I've written now. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for the feedback. That means a lot to me. Thanks. Sure. So let's, let's talk, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. A you, long way. Uh, <laughs> but not in a galaxy far, far away. So, uh, <laughs> so you started your career in journalism at University of Wisconsin at the radio station. What, what drew you to journalism? What inspired you to report the news? Well, that's, that does go a, a long way back. I mean, I grew up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, along the Mississippi River, and for the longest time, I really wanted to go into politics. And I'd, but I'd also been interested in broadcasting as sort of an, a, a hobby. Um, when I was about, I don't know, 12, I think, I stumbled across the local radio station, the rock and roll radio station in La Crosse, WLCX. It's defunct now. And met the, uh, the, uh, the disc jockey who was the, the rock and roll uh, DJ, Pete Lakin. And he invited me into the studio, and I got my first look behind the scenes at um, a radio station. And it was this dumpy um, um, shack in the middle of a swamp mm -hmm. along the La Crosse River. And it was uh, tremendously exciting, uh, for a lack of a better word. And so broadcasting was always sort of playing subconsciously there. And I was a disc jockey at school for the mixers and stuff like that. But, you know, politics was really what I was interested in. And for the longest time, the plan was to get into politics, but go into law with my dad. My dad was a lawyer, and then uh, I was going to do uh, use law as a stepping stone into politics. And when I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1968, that was when the Vietnam War was a big deal. It was in all the papers. 
and there was a draft. And if you had a number below 150, chances are you were going to get drafted. So, you know, the, the campus was seething with anti-war activity. And the thing that really bothered me is when I would go to class, I would be bombarded from both the left and the right to take a position. And I just felt I was being spun. I just felt that whoever was trying to pitch me to go one way or the other was leaving out stuff that would undermine their position. So I was very confused because I came from a Nixon Republican household and Madison, Wisconsin was everything to the left of that. And so uh, I volunteered at a campus radio station to just to get a better feel for journalism uh, and got tear gassed covering an anti-war riot wow. after Kent State. And I think, I, I think that sort of began to radicalize me. And um, I had a number of 14 in the first draft lottery. So, I mean, I was going to get drafted. Mm -hmm. And I enlisted to avoid the draft only because uh, my dad, who was on the draft board, basically said, I'm not going to get you out of this, but talk to a recruiter and find out what your options are. And I discovered that they had military journalism. So I enlisted so I'd have more control over what I'd do when I was in the military. Uh, of course, I promptly got orders to Vietnam, which was a major crisis. But, you know, just as in real life when there's a crisis, you know, in journalism, we call it a story. In real life, we call it a crisis. In fiction, it's a plot twist. And so the plot <laughs> twist in my life was, uh, instead of going to, uh, to Vietnam, my orders were changed two weeks before I was to ship out. They were changed to Germany. And I spent the next two and a half years at the headquarters of the American Forces Radio and Television Network in Frankfurt, Germany, doing interviews on a special events radio unit. And one of the first interviews I did was with this guy named Alfred Hitchcock. You may have heard <laughs> just, of him. Just, just some happened, guy. <laughs> just some guy. And, and, but this was a mentoring moment because my boss, Herb Glover, had worked at CBS with Walter Cronkite. And Herb could have done the interview in his sleep. And instead, he trusted this 22-year-old kid not to screw it up. And that's how I got into journalism because I discovered what I was good at, what I loved, so when I got out of the army, I went back to UW-Madison, and instead of nearly flunking out, I got a degree in journalism, 3.5 average, not brilliant, but I grew up, and that really then was the career trajectory I stayed on for until I, I left CNN after 25 years in 2013, I think it was. I've been retired for a while. Wow. That right there, I, I hope that you're going to write your memoirs someday because, I am wow. Writing them now. I'm oh. writing them now, actually. Well, good. Sign me up. That was, that <laughs> was you. what a story. I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here going, I had all these questions to ask, but I'm going to, now I'm all <laughs> but kerfuffled. But I've talked too long and now <laughs> no. it's all the time we have, folks. No, no, no. I'm just all kerfuffled because there are so many. So, okay. I'm going to start with you spent time in Frankfurt. You you got to interview an amazing uh, filmmaker, Alfred Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. Something about that made you excited. What about talking to people? What about interviewing them and finding out who they are sparked your your creative sizzle, your curiosity? And well, that's a, a really insightful question. And I don't think I've put it into words quite uh, like this before, but something that you said sort of crystallized just now, because I consider myself um, a shy extrovert with introvert tendencies. And the thing that I discovered is that because there's a shyness, the best way to deal with shyness is to get the focus off you as fast as possible. And what better way of doing that than asking someone else a question. And so that then became sort of an instinctive default mechanism. And uh, it just so happened that I worked in a profession where I could do just that. Um, that's not to say that it wasn't scary. I mean, I was petrified, you know, interviewing this guy and you, you never want to sound stupid, but at the same time, 
sometimes those are the best interviews when you're asking questions you don't know the answer to because you're learning. And so that was sort of the fringe benefit of, you know, being shy, being introverted uh, to a certain extent, because then you, when you're, when you're not talking, you're listening and you're learning when you're listening. Absolutely. And it's fascinating that you said that because that idea of listening is so it's it's paramount as far as I'm concerned to being a, a good interviewer in order to be right. able to to find those those nuances to find those little bits and pieces that that are going to make something really blossom and I love that that you've actually crystallized that for yourself but also for me because I I feel the same way I love I'm naturally a curious person and mm -hmm. I love finding things out so let me ask you that right. what right now before we go back to the to the past what are you curious about right now what are you, what what has you excited ooh i don't know if i can an answer that question you're putting me on the spot man yes i am uh, <laughs> i mean you know i you already to a certain extent before we went on you had uh, you were on the receiving end of my curiosity because i was asking you uh, questions about podcasting because that's something I'm entertaining and, and starting to get into. So I suppose that's something that's on my mind now. And I I I, uh, I, I bombarded you with a few questions about <laughs> what you do and why you do it. So you're probably going to be on one of my shows. Oh, fabulous! <laughs> Again, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, and it's funny because this is such a, a fascinating way to communicate. It reminds me of of some of the radio that went on in the 30s and 40s, where this is mm -hmm. the kind of thing that happened. You did interviews like this because mm -hmm. that's what the technology would allow. But now mm -hmm. I think we're getting back to this one on one conversation that allows us to mm -hmm. really explore some deep topics. And mm -hmm. when you were doing that kind of that kind of work, that kind of interviewing work when you were at CNN, when you were a White House correspondent. Talk to me about what what was it like when you started and what what is it what has changed between then and now? Like how we process news, how we report it. What what is your thought on that? Well, well, journalism has definitely evolved and uh, most of its evolution has been has happened because of technology mm -hmm. and technological advances. So when I first got into the business, you know, there were no cell phones, there was no internet. Um, it was basically you and a microphone, hmm. um, maybe a tape recorder, uh, probably definitely a notebook. And then when I got into television, it was film. And that meant that if you were out on a story, you had to get your film back to the, the station, you know, by three in the afternoon so that they could process it. And so, you know, now we are at a point where everyone who has a cell phone can go live. And uh, it's just phenomenal the changes that have happened. And because of that, um, things have gotten more chaotic. Um, so I guess I guess we've we've come a long way, and and even when when I first started out, you know, they were people were talking about how advanced things were from, you know, back in the days even before uh, before broadcasting. I can remember I think Cronkite when he went to radio, you know, he'd been a he'd been a wire service correspondent, and mm -hmm. a lot of people felt that he'd sold out, you know, by going to this this new upstart superficial uh, medium called radio. Hmm. That's so funny. And it is interesting that, that when you embrace technology, there are some people who are going to be all for it. And there are some people who are going to poo poo it. I, mm -hmm. I find that so fascinating. And, and, and yet at the same time, look at even the most recent news stories that some of which have been broken because somebody had a cell phone like Ahmaud Arbery, uh, yes. his, you know, his murder being caught on video we would not know anything about it if that had not happened. If they, if, if somebody had not had a cell phone and, and caught that and right. it became and worldwide news. The, and the, the thing is with, with technology, technology itself is morally neutral. It's mm -hmm. what you do with it. And that's where we run into problems. I, I don't have any kind of a problem with the internet, uh, but I do have a problem with people who will 
forward uh, uh, information that is unvetted or is made up or false or or whatever incomplete you know that's that's where the problem is it's not the technology it's who's who it's it's a matter of in whose hands it is and how they're using it for sure and how they're using it exactly for sure so so what is the way to vet how do they how would somebody who's got a story how would they vet it would they call a reporter would they what's the appropriate what's the appropriate process do you think well i think what you're asking is how does someone get something on the air is that what you're asking or well actually not i mean like you said somebody can get something on the air right now by having a cell phone and uploading it to youtube right so mm -hmm. yeah so so if we're talking about you know vetting vetting a piece of news vetting a story figuring out what what the facts actually are and mm -hmm. and wanting to put it up after having done so how would you do that if you were if you saw something or you videotaped something or you wanted to write about something what is the proper path to make sure that what you put out is true as opposed to fake that is the sixty-four thousand dollar <laughs> question isn't it it is um look the i do a lot of talks and some of the things i talk about is journalism and and the and the whole fake news phenomenon mm -hmm. and one of the things that, and, and some of the time, just about even before Trump was elected, I was getting questions about, you know, media bias. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, my, I can, let's go back to Watergate because my parents were Nixon Republicans. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to go into journalism, as far as they were concerned, I just joined the dark side. Wow. Because they felt that Nixon was run out of the White House by journalists, hmm. which he was, but they were just reporting on what he did. Right. And had there not been those White House tapes, um, he probably would have, uh, you know, finished his second term without a problem because um, they didn't have enough evidence. It was all circumstantial. Right. But when you have him actually on tape uh, talking about the cover up and he's lied about it. Then you've got you've got some elements for um, uh, impeachment. So. Um, when I went into journalism, my mom said to me, she said, if I hear in your reporting bias, even if it's something I agree with, you've failed. Just give me the facts and let me make up my own mind. And so that's really the axiom that I tried to follow in my journalism career. Mm -hmm. So now fast forward. Now we're in a situation where the president of the United States uh, is accusing journalists of being the enemy of the American people right. when the constitution sets up freedom of the press, which is supposed to hold government accountable and also make it possible for people's opinions to be expressed. Mm -hmm. So when you have, you know, the highest elected official in the country undermining the, uh, the institution of journalism, not to mention the intelligence community and the police, whatever, whatever he doesn't like, he does his best to undermine. Right. And there are plenty of people now who don't trust Fauci. They don't trust journalism. Uh, they only trust, you know, the guy with the loudest voice. And so we're now in a position where it's much more difficult to discern what's mm -hmm. fake and what's real, which is something I try to, to, to address in my novel. But it's, it really, I think, is old. It comes back to trustworthy um, uh, organs of, of, uh, of journalism. Um, and there are still tr trustworthy news organizations, mm -hmm. at least trustworthy to me. And that's the problem. Uh, not everybody agrees with me or the, you know, the sources I consider to be reliable. Right. Um, but the, so the point, I'll, I'll make this one point and then I'll shut up. Um, my point when I talk to uh, organizations and, and groups is the point I make is if you're really concerned about fake news, then you really need to look at yourself and your own uh, social media hygiene. Uh, because when you hit post or send, you are a publisher. You have just published something. But 
There's no editor sitting there saying, where'd you get this? How do you know it's true? Which is what happens at the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Associated Press. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is to get a story in print because there's editorial oversight that challenges a reporter to make sure that they are being fair and accurate. And, you know, some Yahoo sitting at home hitting send about Hillary's me emails or, you know, whatever, um, you know, there, there's nobody saying, where'd you get that? I, I, I was uh, speaking somewhere in Southern Virginia and someone was going off on me about fake news. And I remember asking her, where do you get your news? She said, I get it from Breitbart. <laughs> and, oh. my jaw, and my jaw dropped. And she said, well, I've got to have my opinion reinforced. And I said, actually, no, you need to have your opinion informed. And then you can, you know, go wherever you want. But, you know, where do you get the just the facts, ma'am, reliable information upon which you can then form an opinion? You know, I can, I feel strongly about this. Sorry to filibuster. No, no, no. Do not ever apologize. I, 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 I am right. I'm walking that path with you. And, and I'm so glad that you answered as you did because I feel like it's, this is such an important topic and it's so easy to get polarized on one side or another and having mm -hmm. the, the, the cool, calm, collected voice of John Dudekis going, actually, you know, <laughs> My heart rate is about, I don't know, 120 right now, Isolde. Yeah, but that's not what you sounded like. No, here, here's oh. the thing. Here's, here's, here's the important part to me of what you said. You said, you didn't, you didn't say that it has to be what you believe. You said, mm -hmm. get the facts. You said, mm -hmm. make your opinion an informed opinion, an educated opinion. That is crucial, I think. And, and I asked you the question to begin with, because it is something that I think is so important. And I think you obviously have a lot of knowledge about how to answer it. And, and, and you, you answered it exactly as I would have liked. You said, find the facts. That's, that's yeah, how you do you. it. You have to find the facts. And, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that you said that because I think one of the things that's happening to journalists now is that they're, that people are on the attack on one side or the other. And, mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter at this point what the journalist says, somebody's going to say they're wrong, regardless of whether or not they have the facts to back up what they're saying. So, right. mm -hmm. so I'm very grateful that you answered as you did, because it's exactly, I agree with it anyway, and I think probably other people will as well. But, but not everyone. <laughs> but no, and you know what? But you know what? People can change, you know? Sure. People can change. And I, I was a hardcore, fiscally conservative Republican when I was growing up. And mm -hmm. and boy, am I not one now. So mm. and I and I don't make any apologies about it. I'm I'm my political leanings, if you if you follow me on social media, you know exactly what they are. So so I'm not worried about it, but I at the same time, I still want the facts. I still want to mm -hmm to be able to trust what I'm reading. And so often mm -hmm. I end up having to double check and triple check somebody else's source yeah. because I don't trust yeah. that they did, you know? So right. thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing, you. for saying that. Oh no, absolutely. <laughs> so, so let me, let me, I, I, we could talk about this till the cows come home. It's true. And I don't like using animal metaphors. So Sorry, cows. Um, but but let's let's switch gears if you don't mind. You made sure. the switch between journalism and into fiction. Mm -hmm. How how did you do that? How did that transition go? And what made you decide it was time? Well, I was working at CNN as a writer. This would have been in probably eighty eight or eighty nine, and I'd been a White House correspondent, but um, I wasn't able to make that transition to being a correspondent at CNN. And so writing, you know, is a noble profession and uh, it paid pretty well. So I was doing that. And one of the editors, and I was working weekends, I think, nights and weekends. And one of the editors I worked with said, have you ever thought about becoming a copy editor? And I hadn't, other than just, I edited myself fairly ruthlessly all the way down to when I would be, you know, tracking my, my piece. I would, you know, still be making, you know, changes to make the copy a little more crisp. And I said, no, I never had. And he said, you'd be a great copy editor. What he meant was, I want off nights and weekends and you'd be <laughs> a great warm body to replace me. And so sure enough, I got the job. He got the great shift. I did overnights for the next seven years. And the thing I discovered is that editing is tedious. It's fault finding. 
And so the thing that, and it dried up my creativity. It just, it was, it was awful, but it paid well. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I began starting to play with writing on the side, but the transition to fiction was delayed because I didn't really know how to do that. All I knew was just the fact, ma'am. And so I was researching a biography uh, of a friend of mine who was murdered in South Georgia in the mid seventies. And so I was interviewing his wife, interviewing his mistress. Uh, it was going to be a good book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had good sources, uh, but the prob there were a couple of problems. One, it was time consuming. Two, it was expensive because I was, you know, going to different places in the country to do interviews. Uh, and I was also finding stuff up, uh, finding stuff about him that his family didn't know, which was causing a lot of consternation with them. And so his wife actually, his ex-wife actually asked me to put the project on the shelf. And I was more than willing to do that. And then I began to turn my attention to teaching myself how to write fiction. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up doing is taking some of my research for this project and folding it into the storyline of my first novel, which took 10 years to get published because it took me that long to find the agent that I got. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so you fictionalized parts of the research that you had done and, and right. put it into the novel. Interesting. So that yep. actually yeah. leads me beautifully into the next question. What is different between writing journalism or reporting the news and writing fiction? Aside, of course, from the fact that journalism is supposed to be based on truth and facts and fiction doesn't have to be, what's different about it? The, the thing that's different is that, you, you know what? There are actually more similarities than differences. Excellent. Um, I've had, I've talked to people in bookstores who say, no, I don't read novels. I just read, you know, history or, you know, only factual stuff. But the interesting thing about writing fiction is that you can still be factual. And, and at the same time, you are creating characters or drawing from your own life experience and making a composite character. Uh, who can make some of these factual situations come alive because you're much better able to get inside the life of an individual in a way you can't journalistically. And the, another similarity is that uh, good, good writing for a journalist means being succinct because you only have either so much airtime or so much space. And so the challenge is to say what you need to say in, in, in as efficient a way as possible. Also, if you are trying to capture what you see in your mind's eye, that's like being a reporter because you're trying to take what you're observing and then translate that onto the page. So in, very, in, in a very real sense, being a novelist is no different than being a journalist. The, the only difference is that there are times when you are making things up. And in real journalism, unlike what some presidents will tell you, mm. it's a firing offense. But in, in novel writing, it's, it, it gets the job done. And it brings the sizzle, of course. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, in my first two fiction books, uh, I, they take place partially in New York, and I infused places that some of which are real in the in the books, and some of which mm -hmm. I made up. And I've mm -hmm. had fans go, so which are real and which are made up? And I've had fans go to <laughs> uh, go to eighty mm -hmm. seventh in Amsterdam, where I placed this really cool ice cream store looking mm -hmm. for the jumping cow. And of course it doesn't <laughs> exist. And so so I've gotten angry emails. I went to eighty seventh seventh in Amsterdam, and it wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and it's fun to uh to interweave the real and and the and the fantastical. Well, but, why did you play why did you place, a, you know, an ice cream store at that particular location? Why would you do such a thing? Well, for me personally, it's it's right in the building where my grandmother lived when she when we immigrated, we got placed in Detroit, my fam my sort of nuclear family and I. My grandmother got placed on the Upper West Side and she lived at 87th and Amsterdam, so when I was looking for a place to to put my right. fictional ice cream store, that's where I chose. You so, write what you know. You exactly. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think that, and we're going to get into that more too. But I want to ask you, because uh, I do want to, I want to talk to you about how you've related being a White House correspondent to now LARC, 
in your in your mystery series being a white house correspondent but before we get there i want to ask you because i'm a mystery dork i love mysteries what drew you to write this kind of it's almost like a hybrid between a mystery and a and a suspense thriller what what makes them an exciting topic for you what what made you decide this is what you were going to write about well, I stumbled onto it because one of the things I teach in my writing classes is to, uh, uh, one of the classes I teach is how to write a novel. And I basically look at the process from 30,000 feet up so that you can see all of the moving parts. And one of the moving parts is to know what your genre is. And, the, and that's important when it comes time to finding an agent and finding a reader and all that kind of stuff. And the thing that I discovered, and of course, a lot of my teaching comes out of the mistakes I made and the things I learned when I taught myself. Um, for the longest time, I mean, my first novel, Fast Track, went through 14 major revisions. Mm. And the agent I have is like the 39th agent I queried. And probably about the 12th draft, um, I was living in Atlanta and there was a book club that met in our neighborhood and they agreed to read the manuscript over the summer and then let me sit in on their critique. And I write as a woman, which is another question you may want to go to. It's uh, the next so, question, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are 25 women who are taking my novel apart while I'm sitting there listening, which was very instructive, very intimidating. And the thing I noticed is that I had three subplots that I didn't need and by extracting them from the manuscript, it went from a 150,000 word mishmash to a 75,000 word mystery suspense novel. So I didn't know my genre until I got that kind of really helpful feedback from the Princeton Lakes uh, book club. Uh, uh, and that's when, that's when I discovered what my genre was uh, way down the pike. So I stumbled into it. That wasn't the kind of stuff I read. Interesting. So fascinating. And it is interesting how it takes sometimes somebody else to go, well, wait a minute, what did you mean here? Or wait, why is this even here for you to right. go? Hmm, maybe it doesn't need to be. I love, I have a, a number of beta readers for my work and I'm so mm -hmm. grateful that they're willing to read my, <laughs> my drafts and, and tell me oh, what I'm doing wrong and what I'm doing potentially right. It's so wonderful. They're they golden. really, they really are. They absolutely are. So, so yeah, it's funny that you talked about Lark being a woman and you writing a woman. It's, you chose to do this, to write as a young, a, a beautiful, attractive, flawed, intelligent, yeah. you know, firecracker of a, of a woman. How, how did you arrive at her as your main character? What made you decide to write her and also her the way you wrote her? Thank you for saying what you're saying about Lark. I, I feel very close to her. Um, the, the, the way it came about, I stumbled into it. When, I very, when at the very beginning, when I was thinking of, of starting to write fiction, someone suggested that I should write in a way that stretches who I am. Never been a woman, at least not in this life, so I gave it a try. And I discovered that it was accessible to me and the reason that it was accessible is that I discovered that emotions aren't gender specific. We all have the exact same emotions, fear, anger, joy, you know, whatever. It's just that in my experience, it's the women who are much more willing to express their emotions. They're much more um, articulate about their emotions. And the women in my life are more emotionally nuanced. They have a, a palette of emotions to draw from when they do express themselves. And so, uh, and then it also helped to have women uh, as my beta readers because I was at CNN for 25 years. So that's 25 years worth of young women in their early to mid 20s, interns, new hires, who would tell me their stories about their boyfriends, their careers, their families. And I would, because I'm a shy person, I'm listening to their stories and internalizing them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so in many ways, Lark is informed by that. But I'll say one more quick thing, because that's the superficial reason. Mm -hmm. There's actually a much more in-depth reason. Um, and I didn't find that out until many years later. Uh, one of the things I teach about in my writing classes is being able to plumb your subconscious mm -hmm. when you write. 
and not try to write to be fancy, but to try to write to, to find out what's really going on in your own life. And so, um, and so Lark is in many ways informed by my subconscious, but here's the interesting thing. Um, my son went missing uh, about 11 years ago, uh, 22 years old. He'd been a cook at a high-end restaurant in the DC area. And he, and he just went missing, didn't come home one night. And that was out of character for him. Mm -hmm. And he was missing for a week. And uh, uh, long story short, he was found dead in my car about a block and a half away from where we lived in, in Washington. And it was an accidental heroin overdose. Oh. So um, I had to identify his body at the morgue. And I met a representative there from the Went Center for Loss and Healing where I ended up going to grief counseling for probably two and a half years. And my grief counselor, um, Adrian Kraft, is a woman and wanted to know, why do you write as a woman? So I told her what I just told you, the superficial reason. Two and a half years later, after I left grief counseling, the Went Center asked me to give a speech at a banquet as a fundraiser, at a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And as I was writing my talk, I realized that the deeper reason that I write as a woman is that I'm trying to create the kind of person I wish my sister had allowed herself to become because she killed herself in 1980. She was br brilliant. She could have been a surgeon, a concert pianist. And her boyfriend at the time said, what would it look like a football coach married to a surgeon? And hmm. one by one, she gave up her dreams until 20 years later, after, just before they celebrated their 20th anniversary, she went into the garage, closed the door, turned on the gas, and, and ended it. And so that's the first chapter of Fast Track, which was mm -hmm. a catharsis. And the thing that I was realizing as I uh, was writing this speech is that a lot of the women I was meeting at CNN and talking to about their lives, they were the antithesis of my sister because they didn't let a guy define who they were. They still had shortcomings. They weren't, but they weren't victims. And so that is the kind of character I created. It's not, it's not even really a glorified version of my sister. It's sort of me with a skirt on, um, but in a sense, channeling a lot of these really smart, uh, wise women who I've been blessed to know in my life and still do in many cases. Uh, and so uh, uh, when they became my beta readers, then that helped to make sure that Lark's voice was authentic. Wow. First, I, I am so, so sorry for so much, so much grief and so much loss in, in your own life. That's in incredible that you that you are able to in some ways process and and infuse Lark and these books with so much of your own story, but in a really powerful way. Lark is not a, a, a shrinking violet. She's a strong woman. And I love that about her. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I do. I do. Is, is this why? she's had so much grief. I mean, she's had a, in, in, in the series, we see her life unfold. We see, mm -hmm. you know, her, many things have gone wrong for her. I don't want to give away any plot points, but is, is that why can you talk about what made you choose to have her such a troubled past and even present? I mean, life isn't easy for her for sure. Boy, that's a, that's a question I'll probably need to be processing in my journal tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I don't know that, I mean, one of my beta readers said, now you can't have her, you know, having more of these troubles, but you know, as a writer, you have to throw, you, you throw the kitchen sink at your character. And um, I don't think I really started out to give Lark such a challenging life. Um, you do, I mean, I do try to draw from my own experience, but, and there certainly has been grief and loss but I mean, we all have grief and loss. So, I mean, I don't think I'm unique in that sense. Um, I, and, and, and I think it's safe to say Lark has certainly experienced a lot more grief and loss than I have. And many people have, but we're already coming up on the sixth book. So uh, it's, it's an accumulation of, of, of stuff that she's got to fight uh, that, you know, mo most people would, would buckle under, I think. 
but uh, I don't I don't know, Isolde, if I can give you a really articulate answer on that, other than I'm drawing from personal experience and then trying to make sense of it and trying to uh, create a character who's who really is strong and uh, in her weakness, strong in spite of her weaknesses, um, because life is a struggle, and um, and I think that's why we read books to not necessarily to escape, but to maybe learn or find uh, uh, something that's relatable or something that resonates with us. And if that's the case, then figuring out anything deeper about the why is, uh, it's certainly elusive in this answer. It, it, it actually isn't elusive. I, I understand what you're saying exactly, that, that sometimes we don't have to have the conscious answers, but there are threads that we can grab onto and go, hmm, I wonder where this leads me. And it sounds mm -hmm. like in some ways, Lark informs your subconscious, and then of course your subconscious informs her. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and I think, I think that's, a, that, that's a great answer, and it makes a lot of, it made a lot of sense to me. And, and it is interesting it is interesting. Oh, absolutely. It is interesting to me, though, that that um, in reading the books, what happens to Lark, and this is something I'd love for you to talk about, if you would, other people tell her how strong she is, but she doesn't seem to believe it. And I mm -hmm. would love to know, what's that about? Like, she doesn't credit herself with how far she's come. Like, what what's going on with her that when somebody says to her, wow, you're really strong, her immediate answer seems to be either no, I'm not, or or uh, I don't feel strong, or something like that. What makes her this way, do you think? I think it's because of the conversations that I've had with women in my life, who mm -hmm. I consider to be strong. And when I point that out to them, they say the exact same thing. They, they say, well, no, I don't feel I am. And this also goes to what I've discovered as a writing teacher. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. um, I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin in Madison at the Right by the Lake program, and I'm going to be doing it again this June, but uh, online. But last year I was teaching it. It was a week long class. So we had three hours in the morning. So people had a chance to read some of their stuff. And then, you know, I'd teach a little bit and, 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 and build on what we were doing. So um, on Monday, uh, the woman to my left, I'll call her Miss Amazing, you know, read something and it was brilliant. I mean, it was fabulous. I can't write like that. And the woman on my right, on my right, had just gotten out of the army. She was, uh, uh, and uh, I think she was a master sergeant in the army or something like that. She kept calling me sir. <laughs> and I kept calling, I kept saying, you know, if you keep doing that, I'm going to have to have you drop and give me 20 push-ups. And one of the things I said after Miss Amazing read is I said, look, it's very tempting to compare yourself as a writer with something, you know, that you think that you can't do. And, and, and that's really the point I'm making in this, this story about uh, Lark's inferiority is that I think writers in, in general, and not just writers, I think people in general, we compare ourselves to each other and we um, um, feel that we fall short. So, on Tuesday, when Miss Amazing read again, I gave the same pep talk. You know, don't compare yourself. You know, you be you because you're here because you feel you've got something to say. The sergeant said, I'm going to read on Thursday. Okay, that's a moral victory. I'll, I'll be fine with that. On Wednesday, Miss Amazing read again. And the sergeant said, I'm going to read now. And she read out loud what she had written. And Miss Amazing cried. Everybody else gave her an ovation, and I dropped and gave her well, not twenty push-ups, but four push-ups, <laughs> because what she'd written wasn't was was way different in style than Miss Amazing had done, but it was effective, mm -hmm. and that's really the point of it. And and here's the kicker: she told me afterwards. She said, "I've been coming to this conference for four years in a row, and I've never read out loud before." So wow. the point I'm making is that we, I think, as human beings, have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people and feel that we're falling short. And, and all too often, we give up before we've even had a chance to find out what we're made of. Absolutely. And I, I, could, I can't agree more. And I, one of the things I tell my clients, too, is if you're not going to tell your story, who's going to tell it for you? 
That's mm -hmm. that's the ultimate, that's the, the one sentence sort of encapsulation of everything I feel about what you just said. We all have a story to tell and no one's going to tell your story unless you're the one who stands up and tells it or writes it. Or, or if they do tell it, they'll get it wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that brings us back to that whole fact checking. Thing. <laughs> uh, right. Our conversation is a spiral. I love it. So, so let's talk a little bit further, if you don't mind, about the books as a series. They're all standalone, although I, I recommend people read them all because you do get more information. You do get more about Lark. You do get more about the stories and the people in her life if you read the whole, the whole series. But how do, you, how do you work that process? How do you lay out the timeline and the plots? Is everything in your head already? Or do you sort of let inspiration strike you as you begin each new chapter in Lark's life? Uh, well, I didn't even start out to write a series, to be honest. I think mm -hmm. I just wanted to write and get something, get a book published. And so I stumbled into the series because by the time I finished the first novel, I had some ideas for subsequent ones. Mm -hmm. And this is actually not a bad idea because often a, an agent will say, well, what else are you working on? And mm -hmm. uh, because it's a business and they don't want to just represent a one hit wonder. They're interested in longevity. Um, the other thing is that I, I don't just crank them out. I've got some friends who are under contract to turn out a book every nine months. Mm -hmm. To me, that would be like writing with a gun at your head. And so that then gives me the luxury of having things percolate. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, in fact, I was on my walk today because I'm, I'm in procrastination mode on book six. Uh, I've, I've, I've been playing with it, but I haven't really gotten to the point where I'm writing the first draft because I don't have the, the bigger story that I need to attach it to. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with a couple of ideas that might work that might be related to the coronavirus. I'm not sure if I'm even going to use that in the story or not, but it's almost impossible to uh, ignore right now. Sure. So uh, I, I really am only, I only have enough light for the next couple of steps. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I don't crank them out. I think about them and do, I've got plenty of other things I'm doing in my life. So um, that gives me time to, you know, have ideas take root gel and come together. And for your fans to sit with bated breath. Thanks very much, John. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely led left. Uh, I ended fake with, uh, with some loose ends that definitely need to be, uh, if not tied up, at least uh, uh, woven into the next story. Right. Well, addressed. We'll call it addressed. They need to be addressed. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, that's the next question, actually, that I wanted to ask you is I don't want to give up too many details of the book because, you know, people, people, people should read it. Your writing is is so clear and so crisp and lovely that I, I just, if you're listening to this, read the book, that's all I have to say. Uh, <laughs> what can you tell me about fake? What, without giving too much away, what, give me, give me, give me the thing that'll make people sit up and take notice. Well, um, by the time fake starts, Lark has a, uh, um, a professional relationship with the first lady. And so the first uh, there, the, we 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 know. Well, I don't want to give too much of it away either. So, uh, I'll just say that she's interviewing the first lady in the residential uh, quarters of the White House when the first lady dies, and that then, of course, launches the story. And um, um, we meet. We have met the first lady and the and the president to be in troubled water, which is the third novel I wrote, Fake is the Fifth. So those characters start in Troubled Water and have evolved. And Fake, I started writing right after Trump was elected. Hmm. And I was, I was aghast at the whole uh, fake news allegations that he was making and the, uh, uh, the attacks on journalists. I mean, I've had friends who've covered him and they've had to have police escorts to their to their car because of the uh, the anger that he uh, gins up against the reporters. Amazing. And uh, uh, and so I'm I'm really troubled by that. But I did not set out to write an anti-Trump Trump screed um, because truth is not on one side or the other. And so the story I wanted to tell 
and which I really try to tell in all my novels is to give people a glimpse behind the scenes as to how journalism really operates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to a certain extent, it's like watching the sausage made because it ain't pretty. And, uh, you know, if you are uh, a person who does believe that the news media has got problems, well, you'll find them in there. And that's true. I mean, I can't tell you how many arguments I've either witnessed or been involved in in newsrooms when we argue about what's the news and how we're going to cover it. So, um, so that's what I try to do. And so in fake, um, I, br I bring in the Me Too movement uh, because Lark is certainly on the receiving end of a lot of unwanted attention from guys, and she has to manage that. Um, she is attracted to the president, but she is grieving her own loss, as is the president. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to read you just a two-minute snippet, if you don't mind, to give I, you a sense of this. I'd love you know? that. That would be great. Yes, please. Thank you. There, there are actually a couple of different ones that I can do, but I, the ones that I usually read in public give people a sense of what it's like to be a journalist or on the receiving end of, of stuff. So the scene I want to read <clears throat> takes place about two-thirds of the book, you know, two-thirds of the way into the story. By this time, we know that Lark is the subject of a fake news story that's out there. And it's an allegation that she's had an affair with the president. She, we know as the reader that it's not true. Um, and so she is, her life is a mess as usual in, in these books. And so she's been sitting at a sidewalk cafe in DC called uh, Bread and Chocolate. It's not named in the book, but it's at, uh, uh, by Chevy Chase Circle near where I used to live. And so she's been journaling just like a fiend, which is the way I sort things out. And that's the way Lark is doing it too. When she uh, gets done, she's packing up. She realizes that there's a guy who's been watching her. And they strike up a conversation. And um, he's the kind of guy that she'd be interested in, but she's just not on the market, in the market at the moment. But he's been trying to pick her up. And we pick up the scene uh, a little bit into it after they've been talking. Uh, and he, said to, he says to her, I just figured it out, he said, his face brightening. What's that? You're what's her name, the president's girlfriend. Now I was intrigued. What gives you that impression? Well, it's all over the internet. He dug into his pocket, extracted his cell phone, and did some serious scrolling. Here it is. He thrust his phone toward me so I could see the shot, the picture of Gannon, the president, with his hand on my shoulder. You're Lark Chadwick, Miss Fake News herself, he said proudly. So glad to have made your day, I stood. Me too. Say, is he any good in bed? I think we're through here, Jake. Hell, we're just getting started. His expression darkened and hardened. Why do you liberal media types hate this country so much? You don't even know me, Jake. Oh, I know your type. While I'm getting shot at in Afghanistan, you're banging the president, as his wife is dying, no less. I should have walked away. Instead, I took a deep breath, pulled my chair over to his wrought iron table, sat down, folded my arms on top of the table, and leaned toward him. A minute ago, you're trying to pick me up, I said, trying to impress me with how rich you are, trying to flatter me about how hot I look. And then when you realize I'm a journalist, you judge me based on information that's not even true. But do you even... He grabbed me by the forearm and squeezed so hard it hurt. Ow! He stuck his face in front of mine, lowered his voice, gritted his teeth and hissed, Listen to me, you stuck-up snowflake little bitch. In Afghanistan, I killed better people than you. Let go of me, I demanded, my stern, even tone matching his. We were eyeball to eyeball. He tightened his grip. You need to be taught a lesson. His, voice, his eyes were wild, crazed. I'll stop there. Ooh. Yeah, I remember that scene. Ah, it taught. I will call it taught. She, yeah, that's that's lovely. Thank you for doing that. Is there anything else you'd like to read out of the book? I would, if you don't mind. I um, don't mind at all. We have no time limit here. So as much as you want to read, I would be delighted to hear it. I have two choices. I'll let you be the judge. Mm -hmm. There's one, it's the scene in National Cathedral just before the First Lady's funeral. 
-hmm. And often I give, I read this to give an example of the fact that reporters are biased. They are human beings. The trick is that they need to be able to take the bias out of their, you know, their, their need, they need to extract that or set it aside when they actually write their stories. So Lark is in, in National Cathedral ruminating about God. The other is a conversation that Lark has with herself on Air Force One. She's been, the president uh, has given her his personal phone number. Now there's an op, now there's a bombshell story that some whack job media uh, uh, blog has just launched and she needs to confirm it. You know, she doesn't know if it's true or not. And so she's debating her, with herself on whether or not to text the president. Ooh, I remember both scenes. I love both scenes. I, you know, if you're willing to read both, I'd love it. If not, I, I, <laughs> you know, the, the conversation between, between the two larks was informative and also hilarious. So that's the one I'd love for you to read if you don't mind. <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay. So, um, Lark is on Air Force One and, uh, uh, hold on. My book is falling apart here. Um, and, I, and every now and then I do this in my, in my books where I have Lark argue with herself because there's sort of a good Lark and a bad Lark. And in this case, I, I label them responsible Lark and selfish Lark. <laughs> um, so Lark is, is deciding whether or not to text the president. Responsible Lark, don't text him. Selfish Lark, why not? Responsible Lark because he probably gave you his cell phone number as a personal gesture. So, so it means that he'd be pissed if you took advantage of his personal gesture to crassly work a story, selfish lark. But if it's a personal gesture, then he wants me to get personal with him. Yeah, maybe, but that's the problem. What's the problem? He's the hunk and he's into me, responsible lark. Yeah, and that's the problem. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Why? Because if you text him about a story you're working, then you're taking advantage of his generosity. You're being selfish. But if you text him and say, hey, you little stud muffin, let's hang, that's not you being selfish? I would never do that because I am too boring. I was going to say responsible. Still boring. Responsible lark. Silent. Sulking. Besides, who says stud muffin? Selfish lark, smelling blood and moving in for the kill. So let me see if I understand this. Because you're so responsible, I hear that cynical tone. Don't interrupt, responsible lark, petulantly. But you did. Yes, but I was being selfish. It's my nature. Responsible lark, sighing. Go on, selfish lark. As I was saying, explain to me how you're being a responsible journalist if you decide not to use the special access you have with the president to check out this bombshell story, responsible Lark. Um, right. Just as I thought, try using the, I was just being responsible argument on your editor. When you get scooped by Reuters, my thumbs were trum trembling as I typed this text to the pres to president Gannon. It's Lark. I need to talk with you alone. It's urgent. I take a deep breath to keep from hyperventilating, and then I hit send. Selfish Lark, smugly. Nicely done, Lark, but you're so selfish. Oh, I love that scene. Oh, that was so much fun. <laughs> it was fun to write. It was fun to write. Uh, but, you know, and it captures the, the, the two, the, the angel and the devil sitting on your shoulder, <laughs> having a You've conversation. You've never had that happen to you, have you? Oh, no, never. <laughs> At least four or five times a day, I think. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's sad but true. So <laughs> let, let me ask you a quick question about the other characters, because you've got great characters in the books that aren't Lark. How do you develop mm -hmm. them? Lark, I understand, is an amalgam of, of sort of your own subconscious and the, and the many women in your life who've, who've informed mm -hmm. her. But, but what about some of the other characters? Lionel comes to mind. Where, where do they come from? How, how do you develop them? Do you keep character sheets? Do you, mm. What do you do to, to make them come to life? Well, you obviously assume I'm more organized than I really am. Um, <laughs> Lionel is, uh, is Lark's mentor, and she meets him when she's trying to 
uh, look into her past because the f fast track, the first story starts out when she discovers the body of the aunt who raised her from infancy after her parents had been killed in a car accident. And when Lark discovers the body, that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty tragic because that's her real connection to her own past. And so she goes to the small town in southern Wisconsin where the accident happened, gets a newspaper clipping, and she discovers she's the miracle baby who survived a car train collision. <sighs> Nobody had ever told her about that. So uh, she convinces Lionel Stone, who's the newspaper editor, to let her do a follow-up story on the crash. Now, Lionel is an interesting guy because, uh, again, it's a, it's a, he's a composite. Um, one of the guys I worked with at, uh, at CBN in Virginia Beach, uh, Bob Slosser, was a former na assistant national editor at the New York Times before he uh, founded the CBN News in Virginia Beach. And, um, and so that was a connection that I had to a person who, you know, was at the New York Times during Kennedy's presidency, during the assassination, during Vietnam. And so um, I remember peppering him with all kinds of questions about that. And so um, a lot of Lionel is made up of, uh, of a Bob Slosser, although Bob was a much kinder and gentler person. Lionel is much more irascible, and w which is probably where I come, come in again, because that's one of my personality traits. I guess I have sort of a <laughs> choleric personality. And so some of me is in, in look, all of me is in some of, you know, I'm in, I'm in all of my characters in of one course. way or another. It's just the way it is. You know that. Sure. Um, but so Lionel is, 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 uh, is, a, is, a, is a mentor. And, um, and so I get, you know, I've been a mentor to people. I mean, I, I don't really set out to be that, but you know, they say you're my mentor and I go, okay, that's a lot of pressure. Um, but you know, but I'm a dad, so you know, and and Lionel can be a dad, and that got him into trouble with his daughter. Not this. This then exaggerates my own, you know, relationship with my kids. Um, but I can certainly be, you know, I can certainly understand, you know, the parent who cares so much about their kid that they can be overbearing, and and uh, and so that's, you know, another side of Lionel that that. Uh, is is fleshed out in bluff which is the second novel so i don't i don't know i mean you know there's uh, he's a composite and he's he's a fun character too um his wife muriel i don't know as well i'm getting to know her better as the as the stories on spool i i only have a few characters that go from book to book paul stone is another one that's lionel's son who works with lark at uh, the associated press and that is another loose end that uh, we're going to be dealing with in the next book. And, and you left that a pretty big loose end for sure. It, it, <laughs> yeah, you know, and it is interesting to me to hear you talk about Lionel and Muriel in the way you just did, because throughout the books, we get to see Lionel. Lionel may keep things hidden, but I think he's probably gotten to the point in his life where he's like, I don't have to hide a thing. Whereas yep. Muriel is more circumspect, you know, it, mm -hmm. reading her thinking, you know, sort of trying to get inside her head. And mm -hmm. I wonder if, if, if this idea of not knowing her as well, if, if perhaps you're not, you don't know her as well is because as a character, she's a little bit more mysterious, you know, just, Boy. just, mm -hmm. yeah, no, just go I ahead. Think, I think you're onto something. I hear my I hear my wife's voice a lot in Muriel, mm -hmm. um, but I can't say that Cindy is is Muriel. That's that's a stretch. Mm -hmm. But um, but I do hear her voice, and 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 my wife is one of my tougher interviews. I mean she <laughs> she she knows she only I only get three questions with her. It's like you know how was your day? Oh what about that? And usually one more and then she goes and eh, that's all i want to say about that and so so you know she's hard she's a tougher nut to crack mm -hmm. and um although i may i may interview her on one of my podcasts if she'll if she'll let me fabulous but, but getting back to muriel well you know that's part of the process and that's part of the joy of life i think because you know people are discoverable but not always sometimes they're elusive and um sure. we don't know everyone in our life the way we would like to you know sometimes they kind of prefer it that way 
And so I guess by it's, it's inadvertent, quite honestly, that I don't know her as well as I'd like, but um, I'm intrigued. Yeah, and, you know, if there are going to be more Lark Chadwick books, I imagine Muriel and Lionel are going to play a role in those books. So we, we may get to know her better as you get to know her better, which I think is great. Thank you. So, so let's, let's shift gears a little bit, if you don't mind. You've been, you've been giving us these tantalizing bits and pieces of the fact that you are a teacher and that you do writing workshops and things like that. And I, I can attest you're a fantastic teacher. I, I said that up front. Thank you. So, so oh, my pleasure. And, and because of that, I feel like I can, you know, sing your praises from the rooftops. But I, I want to ask you, uh, what, what is it that you're trying to teach? And how do you go about teaching people when they're, you know, you have a, a workshop called Novice to Novelist, which I think is a phenomenal name. Uh, but it means, you know, you, hey, you're a rank beginner. You, you might be afraid to put words down on a page. And from there, we're going to get you to writing a novel or, or far on the way. How do you start? How do you get your students to start opening up that part of themselves? Because that can be the, you know, the first sentence is one of the toughest, you know, and mm -hmm. I, often tell, I often tell the people I work with to, to help them learn how to write, don't start with the first sentence you know, start, start in the middle somewhere else. What do you, what do you do to help them open themselves up to start writing? Uh, well, p part of it is that uh, I guess there's a certain degree of empathy because I guess I, what I try to do as a teacher is, is to capture th what I remember feeling when I was floundering and not sure about how to go about doing it. And so I've, been able to identify the different elements that are involved in becoming uh, a novelist. And so the part of the job is already done for me because when they're in the class, they're there because they really want to learn. And that certainly makes all the difference. I mean, any middle school teacher will tell you how difficult teaching is when these kids just, you know, not only are their hormones raging, but they're there mm. because they don't want to be there. And so really middle school, School English is probably crowd control more than anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that problem. I've got people who are motivated. And so they're really there just to learn. And I'm just there to uh, basically say, I've been there too. These are the things that I've learned in the process. So it's not, it's, I guess what I'm trying to do is just to help them relax into it and be informed about what to expect. Because I think a lot of times in my experience, people will, um, you know, you'll, you'll wake up from a dream or you'll get out of, the, out of the shower and it's like this idea has just fallen whole into your lap. And you have this writing enthusiasm and you write white hot for maybe 50 pages. And, you know, you're just trucking along and, you know, you're, you're, you're going to write the great American novel until you get to about page 50. And then you realize there are a lot more moving parts than you anticipated. Uh, you're overwhelmed. You hit the wall and you put it away in discouragement thinking you have no business being a writer because obviously you can't finish. And so the, one of the things that I try to do is encourage people to just do the prep work, do the spade work. If you've got an idea, start playing with it and exploring it uh, before you start writing prematurely. And the, and the inner barometer is when you can't really, you know, when you've, when you've gotten to know your characters and you've sketched out your plot and you have an idea of where it's going to end, you know, that's the time to write. So you're like you're sort of like at the horse at the Kentucky Derby, waiting for the bell to go off and the doors to spring open so that you can race down the track. You know that's when it's time to write, as opposed to just feeling like oh, I think I've got this story I want to tell. Um, so that's what I try to do. It's it's you know I, I guess it's a matter of just encouraging. I mean that's probably if it's gonna if there's gonna be anything on my gravestone, it's gonna be he tried to encourage. Um, another one could be, I told you I was sick. But, you know. <laughs> My husband um, says but, he's going to put mine is going to be, uh, there's just so much to do. That's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, encouragement. I just try to help people realize that this idea that they've got, this desire that they've got, that came from somewhere. And then it's just a matter of what are you going to do to explore it and act on it? 
see now that's the thing it's that what you just that last sentence what are you going to do to explore it and act on it is so mm. it's so telling because i know lots of people who have ideas oh i've mm. i've got this great and i've had people i don't know if this has happened to you i've had people say i've got this great idea for a book let me tell it to you and you can write it and i'm like yeah. i oh, i'm yeah, writing yeah. you know i'm writing my own books <laughs> uh right. so so you know where do they start you, what, what what do you suggest they do first? If you were gonna, if you're talking to someone who's who's just said the words, I've I've always wanted to write a book, but I have mm -hmm. no idea how to start. What would you say to them? Take my class. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, absolutely. That, well, look, I think if you've got an idea, start exploring it and. Um, there, there are several ways you can go about doing it, and probably one of them will be right for you. Um, the great thing about writing is that it's like, it's like dipping a straw into your subconscious, and the act of writing stirs things up, and it just goes from your subconscious through your fingers and onto the page. Mm -hmm. And so just start exploring that, you know, maybe you put that idea in words so that it's there objectively so that you can look at it. Um, and that then can be the stepping stone for the next thing. If you've got a concept, let's say that you've got this idea about writing a story about a jaded weatherman who has to cover Punxsutawney Phil yet again and is doomed <laughs> to live the same day over and over again until he gets it right. That's a concept. Right. And some people, you know, have these concepts. Write it down and then follow your curiosity and ask yourself, well, where does this jaded weatherman live? Well, probably Pennsylvania or nearby. Mm -hmm. And why is he jaded? And, you know, just ask these questions and then answer them on to the page. And really, and I think you can, uh, you would attest to this as well, because you write, it's just a matter of discovery. Writing is a way of discovering the story. And it's also a matter of self-discovery. Um, because I think that there's a direct connection between effective writing and effective self-knowledge. You know, the better you know yourself, the more you're going to be able to draw articulately from your stuff and uh, and put it down. So following your curiosity about the story that you've got uh, and building those characters step by step, bit by bit, is I think a good place to start. That's a terrific place to start. Thank you for that answer because I think there are people out there, many people who would love to write but have no idea mm -hmm. what that first step is. Yeah. You know, it's it's it, and it's tough because it's your story and you're trying to tell it. And as a novice writer, like you said about about uh, Ms. Amazing and the the woman from the military, the mm -hmm. woman from the military, she years she went without reading her work out loud, and yet mm -hmm. it was amazing. It's uh, in mm -hmm. its own right, you know. So in I its think, own right. mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's so. It's so wonderful to have someone who encourages you to to keep striving and i think that's what you're doing and you i remember for in the workshop i took with you that's what it was you you wrote in you signed fast track for me and you said something along the lines of keep writing you've got this and i thought wow that was that was lovely thank you <laughs> I, I i thought wow because i i was at a as a as a i was pretty i'd written nonfiction books but i had not written uh, a lot of fiction books and so so that was it's a different it's a different animal as far as i'm concerned so i was very nervous about it and to hear you say that about the story that i wrote in that workshop was very powerful for me so i thank you for that well thank you for that too i appreciate it thanks sure absolutely so let's let's move along because i know you have a life to get back to uh i know that you that you do these little tidbit writing videos on linkedin I, mm -hmm. I've seen those and I've noted them very carefully. Where else can people find your teaching? If someone wanted to take a John Dadakis workshop, where mm. would they go? What would they need to do to do that? Probably the, the best thing, I mean, I haven't updated my website in a while. So my, ever, ever since the coronavirus hit, a lot of my things have been either canceled or moved online. Mm -hmm. So, but my website is one place 
uh, johndenakis.com. But as far as specific writing classes, I've been doing a lot of them on uh, 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 scheduling them through uh, uh, Eventbrite. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were to search my, for my name on Eventbrite, then that's often where we post the upcoming uh, writing classes. Uh, I'm also going to be teaching at the University of Wisconsin's Right by the Lake program in June and also at the Loft, which is a literary center in uh, Minneapolis. But again, both of those gigs went online, so, um, so that's where they'll be. And um, um, so at this moment, we're, this is, we're being taped in mid-May, and I don't think this is going to air until June. So I don't, I don't know other than what I've just mentioned, but Eventbrite will be a good one-stop shopping, you know, where if there is something that's going to be offered, it'll be there. And the good thing is that it's online. So if you live in Timbuktu, we can do this. Absolutely. And I, you know, that's one of the pluses of, of this whole time of sheltering at home is that a lot of things that we didn't realize would work online, work brilliantly online. So, mm -hmm. so it's really nice to have that as a resource. And I will put, I will find you on Eventbrite and I will put your links up on the show notes page, as well as of course your, your website and your LinkedIn uh, profile, but also you're on Facebook. So where is it? Mm -hmm. Is it John Dedekis? Should I just find mm -hmm. it on there and put it on there? Yeah, I've got, I've got a group page. I've got a fan page. I hate to call it a fan page, but that's what Facebook calls it. And I've got my own personal page, but all of them are public. So, um, um, you know, that's another place to find me. Great. I'll find I'm on you. I'm on Twitter, but I'm not very effective. I'll never be president. <laughs> Thank goodness you're not using Twitter the way he uses Twitter. That's all I have to say. Uh, so uh, I just have a couple of more questions. And I know, I know, I, I keep saying that. I've said that for the last half hour. Talk to me about your nascent podcast. I, you, 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 you sprung it on me right before we started recording. What's that all about? One, one to one with John Dedakis. Talk to me about that. What, what prompted it, and what are you going to do with it? Well, I've been thinking about it for a long time, and I've been interviewed on a lot of you know blog post. Blog, what is it? Blog talk radio, and you know this interview right now, and you know I've been interviewed a lot, but. I'm also comfortable asking a lot of questions. I love to talk to people, but instinctively, I've just been feeling that it's a time suck for me to, to, to start launching a podcast because, you know, I edit people's manuscripts. I'm doing these teaching things. Oh, by the way, I write. So um, it's been on the back burner for a long time, but I came across something called StreamYard. And it's basically, you know, you just go right to air. It's, it, you do it live. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend, uh, Brianna Bowling in uh, Southern uh, Maryland, uh, I met her at a writing uh, workshop I led. And she invited me to be uh, on her podcast. And, and we were talking about the technology of it. And so I actually interviewed her uh, as, and I did it live. I mean, I was going to tape it and she, why do you want to tape it? I said, well, I, I don't know. Cause I don't want to screw up on live. You know, I don't want to screw up in front of everybody. And she said, well, you know, that's not a big deal. I mean, she's at, one of the things we talked about was being an entrepreneur and one of the um, main attributes and, and needed for an entrepreneur is fearlessness. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, here I am with my self doubt and she's going, stop it. So we just did it live and it seemed to go okay. And that was the first one yesterday. She's uh, very articulate, very interesting, but now I've got some ideas for other guests and, and I'll, it's, it has not, it's not official yet, although our interview is out there, but you know, I, I'm thinking of calling it one to one with John Dedakis, and then each episode would be, you know, one to one with Isolde Trachtenberg and uh, you know, okay. different people and different people. I mean, I I know a lot of people who are interesting, mm -hmm. and so um, it when you say nascent, it is it is so nascent it it almost isn't. So <laughs> so so you're helping me to think it through and to. Uh, you know, give me that added encouragement to, to give it a try. Oh, I, I think you should. I think it would be really Thank fun you. to get your take on things. And you are a skilled interviewer. So it would be, you would really bring out valuable 
information from from the people who were guests on your show. And uh, just so you know, I, again, no affiliate no affiliate money from this, but Podbean, which is where my podcast is hosted, you can do live interviews also. I didn't mention that. Uh, when we were wow. chatting about it before, so you can. Um, okay, well that's awesome. I would love, I, I, you know, I would, I would be proud to be on the show if you if you invite me. And also, I'm really glad I have you're, just invited. You're... I have just invited you, <laughs> and I have just accepted. Look at us go. Okay. So so <laughs> so let me let me ask you. You you said that you you ruminate a lot for writing, and you don't you don't hold yourself to a particular schedule. Do you structure mm -hmm. your writing at all when you are writing? Or do you have a routine? And if so, what is it? I do, but I really try to stay away from being legalistic, because I think that that can be um, a straitjacket. Um, so I try to be, a, to a certain extent, flexible and nimble. I find that I'm most effective writing earlier in the morning. I mean, I journal like a fiend and that's pretty much the first thing I do when I get up, which, you know, since I'm retired, I can get up whenever I want. And since I worked overnights at CNN for so long, my body is bludgeoned into submission. So hmm. I only need about five hours of sleep at a time. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can often, you know, wake up early and, you know, whatever fiction writing I'm doing, uh, I'm best doing it in the morning and, you know, I can, if I can get an hour in, that's fine. If I get two hours in, that's inadvertent, but great. If I have, if I get five hours in, it just means that I'm in a panic and I'm in a deadline and it's got to get done. Uh, but more often than not, I'm in procrastination mode, which means then I'm thinking about it, but I'm not necessarily writing. And I think that's also important for a, a, a wannabe writer to keep in mind because if you're ruminating, you're writing. That's part of the process. And you might be an automaton who can write a thousand words a day, but how do you feel about yourself when you only do 800 or 200 or zero? And so I'm just realistic about who I am and how I approach it. So writing, creative writing is best for me in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'm dealing more with marketing and emails and editing people's manuscripts and teaching myself how to play jazz drums and all that kind of stuff. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. <laughs> did you just say jazz drums? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, okay. Tell me more, please. Well, look, um, this goes back to being shy, all right? When I was in high school, no, actually, when I was in junior high, you may have heard this group called the Beatles. Um, oh, I've heard of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. you've, you've heard of them. I heard they <laughs> broke up. I've, I've heard they've broken up. Um, but back then, they were all the rage. And, um, and so I taught myself how to play drums by listening to Beatle records mm -hmm. and Ringo Starr. But my, my sister, who was eight years older than, than I, played uh, first chair clarinet in the band. And so I inherited her clarinet, but I did not her inherit her skill. Uh, so consequently, in spite of the fact that I wanted to play drums, I was stuck playing clarinet. And I was too shy to let my desires be known. I probably could have learned how to play the drums and done a pretty good job at it back in the 60s when it really would have made a difference. So fast forward to about 1996, right? Um, my, my, my wife said, what should we get dad for Father's Day? And my son James, uh, who is now a, a, a professional drummer in Los Angeles, said, let's get him a set of drums which of course is how James taught himself how to play drums. So um, I basically, you know, played the tapes and stuff in the basement and just, it was, you know, I didn't play in public. I was too shy. And then fast forward again, living in DC, um, James and I were at a, uh, a jazz club in DC and there was an open mic jam session. And uh, I said to him, James, are you going to play? He says, no. And I said, well, okay, I should have listened. So instead, I go swaggering up there and sit in. And, you know, the first piece was a pretty basic 4-4 four, four swing, medium swing. I did fine. And then a couple of horn players got up, and I found out later they just played a gig at the Kennedy Center. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, you know you're in trouble where the next song you're playing and you're floundering so bad that the house drummer during the song says, 
I'll take over. Oh. So while the piece is still going on, we're trading sticks and I'm getting out of there so that, you know, somebody who really knew what they were doing could do it. Because rock and roll drumming is, is just basically, you know, you hit the bass, the, the snare drum on two and four and, you know, you play uh, straight eighth notes on the ride cymbal and, you know, you hit your bass drum a couple of times and that's it. Yeah. Jazz is much more intricate. I mean, to the uninitiated, it might sound like cacophony, but you know, there's, there's a very detailed structure and um, sociology connected to the whole thing. And uh, so I, I joined a jazz workshop in Northern Virginia run by Paul Piper, and he brought people together for two-hour uh, sessions where you play with each other, play jazz with each other, and you learn the culture. You learn about uh, uh, song forms. You learn about soloing which is like playing, it's like failing all the time, mm-hmm. but you learn by failing. And, uh, and so um, I, I learned what I didn't know. Uh, I, or, and so it's now going to be a lifelong lesson in, you know, trying to get it right. Well, and, and that's the thing about jazz is that it, it, it feels like there's a lot of give and take, but if you're in the pocket, you're always going to find your way back to that one. You know, you got to find the one. Do you play jazz? Are you <laughs> oh, a jazz aficionado? Oh, I am. I am absolutely. I'm a jazz. I'm a jazz vocalist. And uh, really, and, yes. Well, you've got a great voice. You've oh, got a thank wonderful you. voice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I've been singing since before I was speaking, actually. So, um, wow. yeah, my mom was a professional vocalist in the Soviet Union where I was born, and huh. so I sang. I sang with her before. Apparently, before I could speak, I was singing harmony with what she was doing. So, wow. and I'm a big fan of 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 all of the divas. Your Sarah Vaughan, your Ella Fitzgerald, oh, your. Man. Shirley Bassey, you know, you name it, uh, Billie Holiday, all of all of the great divas. I I love that music. The music of that age is just. Are you Are you doing any gigs? Uh, I mean, right now, no, of course, because everything well, is canceled. Before but, Before this. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and I, I I do I am cognizant that this is supposed to be me interviewing you. However, oh, uh, we'll talk about this. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I play mostly on the college circuit, and mm-hmm. I do uh, diversity shows. So I do music from all over the world, where I include almost 20 languages. I sing in a bunch of languages and I infuse it all with jazz as, as part of the show. So wow, that's when knew? I, yeah, when I perform, when I perform music, that's, that's essentially what I do now, but to get wow. back to you, <laughs> cause, because otherwise, again, we're going to be here till 5 PM. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you if, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing a couple of things. First of all, do you want to tease anything about the next book that you're going to put out maybe well the, the look i have when i when i uh, after i finished uh, fake i had three projects uh that were all basically at the developmental level there was uh there was book six of of the lark chadwick series that i was starting to play with um there was a literary novel that i i wanted to write but that's that's an entirely different genre and it's very character driven and language is uh, is critical in it and so i i just know i'm in over my depth you know considering that but i'm you know i'm i'm playing with that and then there was a memoir and um and i and so what i was doing in my writing time was is was spending time with each of those uh sort of rotating through and the one that took root and the one that i'm working on now is a memoir Mm. And it's and memoir is different than autobiog- autobiography. Auto- mm-hmm. it's, it's autobiographical, but you know the autobiography is you know everything about your life, and you know I'm a nobody, so that's not going to sell. Um, I'm not would... an ex president, so <laughs> um, you need to uh, if you, if you're a nobody who's going to write a memoir, you need to come up with something thematic. Mm-hmm. And so the theme I'm working with, the working title is Pivot Points. Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way you expect. And so what I've been able to do is identify maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 pivotal moments in my life that have brought me to the where I am today. And so that's, and, and I've, I've written about 70,000 words and I'm only in 1988. So wow. 
yeah, it's a first draft, so it's going to need to be whittled. But um, I'm having fun with that, and um, it's a little daunting too. But uh, I'm far enough along that I think I'll be able to uh, whittle it into some sort of coherent whole. And I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be fantastic. I love the title. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So I know a couple more questions. Sorry. You're <laughs> Actually, well, you're, I appreciate this. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. Let me be honest. Uh, hmm. I wanted to find out from you, who, who do you read? Who are you reading right now? Who are your favorite authors? Man, I wish I read more widely. I'm, I am such, I feel like I'm a, a remedial reader and I know that whoever I mention, you know, someone will say, well, you know, oh, really? But um, when I first started getting interested in fiction, it was John Steinbeck. I read Grapes of Wrath mm. in a high school, not high school, a college um, American history class about the Dust Bowl. And so Grapes of Wrath made history come alive. Um, I like John Grisham. I like Stephen King. Um, I've been reading uh, William Kent Krieger, uh, who's a novelist in, uh, in Minnesota. And mm -hmm. I was judge... Uh, a couple of years ago for the Edgar Awards. And um, I was getting like, I don't know, 10 books a day in the mail. And, uh, and you know, we had, we had different teams who, you know, we all got all of the books that were entered, but we only had to read, you know, certain ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we discovered the ones that were the, the top ones, then we read all of those. So whenever a book, and my wife reads voraciously. So whenever a book would come in, I'd go, here you go. And, uh, and, you know, I would read as well. And, you know, after about the first 50 pages, you can kind of tell if, if it's going to go anywhere because you already have a gold standard. And if it's not measuring up, you know, you can't wait till page 200 because you gotta, you gotta hook me. And right. I think that's true. For most readers. So Cindy read Kent's, um, uh, ordinary grace and she said this is the one and as it turned out that was the one because everybody on our team uh, came to the same conclusion um, so Kent Krieger is uh, is a really good writer I like Greg Isles um, uh, he writes uh, mystery suspense and very detail oriented um, I'm reading a lot of uh, um, a nonfiction. I'm reading a very stable genius that uh, Phil mm -hmm. Rucker co-wrote with the mm -hmm. Washington Post. I'm reading the loudest voice in the room, Gabriel Sherman's book about Roger Ailes, which I find very insightful. You get a much better holistic look at who Ailes was, especially you know growing up, and that helped helps me understand why he became the kind of person he became. I'm reading. Uh, 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 the book, uh, it's called The Library Book, about the major fire that destroyed the Los Angeles Library in 1986. Mm. And that's part of our book club. That uh, uh, So I'm reading books that I normally wouldn't read. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, wish I, re I wish I read more than I do. I'm, I'm reading, obviously, manuscripts that of books that haven't been published yet. So you know, I'm, I'm trying to help them whip them into shape. Um, I'd say so, that's plenty. That, that's yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, funny. Yeah. You keep punctuating what you're saying with, I wish I read more. And then you list another 14 books that you're reading and wait, I wish I read more. Here's another four books I'm reading. I think, I think, I think you you're reading plenty. You know, it's good. It's good to know those, those authors that spark your imagination and that, and that make you want to read more, because I think I'm going to put some of these books in the show notes just so that, so that people can, once they're done reading all, all five books that you've written, uh, hmm. go ahead and, and, and see some of the other writers that you, that, that you find yeah. uh, interesting. I'll add, and I'll add one more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll add one more. Uh, Brad Parks. He's a, he's a, lives in Northern Virginia. I've, I've started reading uh, uh, some of his books and his character writes in the first person as do I, mm -hmm. although his, his, his uh, protagonist is, uh, is male and a newspaper reporter and, uh, and has sort of lark snarkiness. And, uh, and again, it's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a good fast read. Uh, and yet you get a good sense of how journalism operates too. Oh, that's wonderful. Shedding, shedding the, the facts in with the fiction is wonderful. I love that. Mm. So, so, 
I have one last question and then I will so let you go you get it. Say. I know. <laughs> This is a silly question, but I find that it's really, uh, it's, it's illuminating. And here it is. If you could have an airplane skywrite something for everyone in the world to see, what would you say? Don't give up. There you go. Succinct. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. I love it. Well, Somebody. It's, all, it's, it's an airplane. There's no room for asterisks and right. Know, exactly. It's sentence. it's got to be short and sweet. Somebody. Yeah. Somebody uh, in an interview recently said, "Be kind," and it was the same kind of. Yep. Same thing. <laughs> I could do that too. I would. I wouldn't be in favor of that. Yeah. I just. It's really. It's an interesting question to me because it does it mean you have to take everything and sort of solidify it into one little nugget instead of, mm -hmm. because I'm verbose, as you might have noticed. And I, I would go, well, then you could do this and you could do that and you could do this. And no, you have to skywrite it. It has to be very short. And that, that That's is an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, when I first started asking it, people looked at me funny, but I didn't care. I think that is, <laughs> it's something mm -hmm. that I, it, that I, it really it distills everything that mm -hmm. you've been saying today into mm -hmm. one sentence don't give up you know you you've you've had many times when you could have given up and you didn't and here you are so mm -hmm. i really appreciate that that was your that that was the the thought that you wanted to give and is there any other last bit of advice or wisdom before we end this conversation that you'd like to put out there whoa uh no i mean thank you for this opportunity i mean uh, it's a it's a joy to be talking with you because you ask good questions um uh, you've you know, you've read Lark and like her, so that's certainly an encouragement. But, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. This has been John Dedakis dropping wisdom all over the place. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. My name, once again, is Isolde Trachtenberg, and you have been listening to the Creative Mindset Podcast, where we are exploring how we can all live and work better creatively through using that creative mindset. If you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to the podcast, whether it's iTunes or Google Podcasts or uh, Spotify, leave a review, let me know what you're thinking, comment, please. The community we're building here is so important, especially at this time when we are all discovering the opportunity to be creative. Once again, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, and until next time, I send you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. Today's music was Kevin McLeod's Ave Marimba, brought to you by Creative Commons License 3.0 and Summer Fashion by Alexander Shemaluev. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I send you all of my love.